Hear these words from the prophet Jeremiah for our call to worship. They treat the wound of my people as if it were nothing. All is well, all is well, they say, when in fact nothing is well. Please join me in an opening prayer. This prayer is adapted from number 671 in Hymnal the Worship Book. O oh God, we come seeking you in our worship together. We come to you for truth because we are untrue. We come to you for strength because we are weak. We come to you for wisdom because we are unwise. We come to you for your presence, for we are lonely. We come to you for healing, for our souls and our bodies are sick. We come to you for rest, because we are tired and worn down. Move in our midst this day, we pray. Show us your truth, your strength, your wisdom, your healing, your love, and your rest. Through our Savior, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning to everybody. Uh, wherever you are and wherever you may be watching, we welcome you again to another online edition of Toledo Mennonite Church. If you watched the online service from last week, you may have remembered that call to worship that I read from Isaiah, I'm sorry, Jeremiah, uh, chapter 6, verse 14. It's this idea of the prophet crying out against the the rulers and the general status quo of the society of ancient Israel leading up to the time of the exile, where all the false prophets and, and all those who were invested in the system as is wanted to just paint things over and brush things over and say, all is well, all is well, but Jeremiah, the voice of God, was saying, no, not, not all is well, very little is well. I read that last week as we had a service of lament following uh, the events in the nation that we saw with George Floyd and his unjust killing uh, and the eruption that happened around that. I read it again today because throughout the week I had many conversations with uh, the leadership team. We met as a leadership team. I met with my pastor peer group from the Northwest region of Ohio Mennonite Conference. I had a couple conversations with members of Toledo Mennonite Church individually, some check-ins or, or connections with them, and even just some friends and, and people that I've encountered along the way. And it named a reality that perhaps uh, I knew was there or, or we all had a sense was there, but it heightened the urgency for me that not only was it appropriate to name and set apart time last week to lament the events um, uh, surrounding uh, the, the death of George Floyd, but there are a lot of things that we are going through individually and collectively that require time and space to honor with lament. And I think Last week was sort of a cathartic experience to open up a time in worship to lament that, that opened up a cry and a need for, for more of that. And so again, this week, um, it did not seem right for me to go ahead and plow forward with the series on 2 Corinthians that we're doing just because I planned it months ago, and it doesn't mean I, I, that we are, we are bound to that. And, and again, this Sunday, it didn't feel right for me to just plow ahead with that, that it felt that we needed more time and more space and maybe just permission to lament so much 
of what we are struggling with, so many of the, of the various kinds of burdens that we carry. And so that's what I want to do again today. And so that's again why I read from the prophet Jeremiah to call us to this worship, uh, this time of worship. And I want to give you a little bit of an explanation of how this will unfold. We have we will have three readings from the Psalms. The Psalms are an excellent uh, collection of the worship literature of ancient Israel that guide us uh, in all times and in all seasons of our life of faith, especially times of lament. And the Old Testament scholar and biblical theologian Walter Brueggemann wrote a spirituality of the Psalms that involve orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. And he sort of divided the Psalms into Psalms that uh, orient us to God, Psalms that speak to our times and experiences of feeling disoriented and distant from God, and then Psalms that speak to having come through a period of disorientation, we reorient ourselves to a deeper understanding of God or a new reality of what God is doing and has done in us and through us and among us. So orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. In many ways, this follows the cruciform pattern of Jesus. Jesus was born, he lived, he went about doing good and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. But then Jesus died, and then Jesus rose. So in Jesus' life, we have this cruciform pattern of living, dying, rising. Living, dying, rising. And that overlays very nicely onto this uh, understanding in the Psalms of orientation, disorientation, reorientation. There are, all, there, there are ways in which so many of us in, in our own stories, in our own histories, and in our own faith journeys uh, experience times of living, of, oriented, of, of, of living oriented toward God. There are times of disorientation where there's a death that occurs, maybe literally, maybe figuratively, where something changes, we're disoriented, and, and things are not going the way that we thought they would go. And then there are times of rising, of, of reorienting, of, of coming to a new creation and a new life that only God could make possible, that only God could make the way. And so that's what I invite you into this morning in a time of worship, to, to continue to name those things that we lament, continue to the name the ways that maybe at times we felt oriented to God. And it seems for a lot of us, for both reasons... Um, personal, social, and global, that we really, it seems like a lot of us are going through a period of disorientation. And we're maybe in the midst of that, that, that the orientation that we once felt, the living, the aliveness that we once felt is going through um, a crisis. That something in us, around us, or just in our minds is, is dying and falling away, and we need to shift gears, and we aren't sure how to do that. And yet we look forward to the new creation, the rising, the, the reorientation that may emerge. And, and honestly, maybe sometimes that feels far away and it just feels empty at times. But the pattern of the Psalms and the pattern of Jesus' own life shows us this cruciform pattern of living, dying, rising. And so today for our worship, I am uh, where there's going to be a series of readings of three different Psalms, a Psalm of orientation, a psalm of disorientation, and a psalm of reorientation. After each psalm, there will be some discussion or some, some question prompts. Uh, and they're open-ended questions. And we trust and hope and pray that the Spirit leads you and guides you through those questions. So don't just rush through the video. Uh, but, you know, when you get to those sections, pause the video uh, I'll, I'll leave some intentional gap in the video, um, but also if you need more time, pause the video and reflect on those questions. 
see what the Spirit is stirring inside you through these journey of the, through the Psalms of orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. There'll be some music interspersed, and then I'll have a, a pastoral prayer uh, for us as the congregation at the end. So that's the plan this morning. And so I invite you to continue pouring out your heart to God in all the ways that you need to pour your heart out to God. Last week opened up some space for that. This week we want to continue that and go deeper into that. Before we continue and before we get going on the rest of our worship service, I do have a few announcements. One is if you are a member and a regular participant of Toledo Mennonite Church, hopefully you are on our mailing list, our email list for the newsletter. And the most recent edition of the newsletter that was sent out on Friday has some information, uh, some further information about our approach as Toledo Mennonite Church to the COVID-19 virus and our approach to reopening the church. Here in Ohio, uh, a lot of sectors of uh, uh, businesses and the economy are beginning to, to open. A lot of churches are beginning to reopen. But as we've said all along, we're not going to be at the forefront of that. Uh, we think there's too much risk and not enough reward, so to speak, for, for that. We are going to take a cautious approach. That is still what we are doing, but there's some more information in the e-newsletter about, okay, now that we begin to see things opening up, what, and we are beginning to think about that as a congregation, but, but what, is, what are some approaches that we're going to take and what's that timeline going to look like? So, so if you're curious about that, I know a lot of people are anxious and desiring to, to get back together, just human contact. Um, there's something more alive and robust and, and spirit-filled when we can be together. I get all that. And so there's a desire for that. We're not quite there yet, but see the MailChimp uh, newsletter for details about that. The second thing then is um, Monday evening uh, at 6 o'clock, tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock, we are having a church cleanup day. Now, are we contradicting ourselves between taking a cautious approach to reopening worship and uh, having a church cleanup day? Uh, I don't know. Maybe some people might think that. I don't necessarily think so. Um, because the church cleanup day is going to be outside. It's going to be on our grounds. It's going to be pulling weeds, trimming trees, doing things like that. We will be outside in the fresh open air, which greatly reduces the, the uh, spread of the virus. We will be socially distant from one another. We're not going to be working on top of one another. If you know our buildings and our grounds, there's, it's a pretty sizable chunk of property. So we'll definitely be able to spread out. And if you want to uh, wear your, your mask, you are certainly welcome to do that. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable doing it, uh, there's no requirement that you do come. Um, it's just the reality that some weeds are growing, some bushes are getting overgrown, some trims ne trees need trimmed. Um, and so tomorrow evening, 6 o'clock, Monday at 6 o'clock, if you are able uh, and feel comfortable, we are having an outdoor work day here at the church. Again, those details are also in the MailChimp, so please, please, please be reading your MailChimp. Um, that's the main way of communication that we have as a congregation during this time of, of physical distancing. So, was that enough? Um, you have a little bit of uh, some announcements there to, to be aware of and a little bit of a guide to our worship experience today. With all that being said, this is the time in the worship where we would typically uh, stand and greet one another with the peace of Christ. Uh, after Jesus lived and died and rose again, he appeared to his disciples and he uh, spoke into their fear and their anxiety and their worry and their uncertainty. And he said, peace be with you. And so at this point, uh, take a moment to picture the congregation in your mind's eye and in your heart and pass the peace of Christ to one another. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. 
you have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Psalm 8 is an example of a psalm of orientation. Psalms of orientation speak of things like the wonder of God's creation, of God's wisdom, of the favor and the blessing of God. Psalms of orientation speak to a life oriented towards God, where God seems real and alive and vibrant, that a person is experiencing the presence of God, that a community is flourishing by following the ways of God. Psalms of orientation direct us to an attitude of worship, wonder, joy, curiosity, and a shared love between God and humankind and humankind with one another. When in your life have you felt oriented to God? When did you sense God's living presence in your life? Think deeply about that. Where were you? Who were you with? What was happening? How long did that moment last? How long did it sustain you even after it passed? Maybe you have several periods in your life where you felt deeply oriented toward God. When was the last time you had that experience? Is it fresh? Or has it been a while? When's the last time you have reflected and relived and brought to mind that time or that experience in your life? How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O oh Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, and he has been good to me. Psalm 17 is an example of a psalm of disorientation. Unfortunately, 
remaining oriented toward God is not the only experience that we have as Christians. You know, maybe one day it will be, but it's, it's a reality and it's truth that we all go through times of feeling disoriented to God. If you are in that experience or if you have had that experience, you are not alone. I think sometimes in church culture or maybe just a, an individual impression that we might have, we might um, shame people or beat ourselves up if a person admits to or feels like they're going through a time of disorientation. But um, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, Nothing could be further from the biblical witness. Uh, The prophet Jeremiah, who I read at the call to worship, certainly went through times of feeling disoriented, wondering what God was doing, and, and he was a prophet. Many saints in the Old Testament and the New Testament and throughout church history have gone through periods Not just a day, not just a moment, not just a a fleeting sort of doubt or uh, wavering of faith, but many saints have gone through deep periods of disorientation. Uh, Seasons, months, years, where one's relationship with God seems dry, uh, seems distant, and We feel disconnected from God, from ourselves, and from the world around us. When have you felt disoriented or distant from God? When have you felt disoriented and distant and disconnected from God? others around you, friends, family, loved ones even? When's the last time you felt chaos break out in your life and in our world? In my conversations with people in this congregation, other pastors and what they're experiencing personally and in their congregations, many, many people are experiencing that right now uh, in this season that we are in as individuals and as a people. When has been a time in your life where God just seems like a nice idea, but not a living reality? When is a time that God or the Christian life itself just stopped making sense to you? When have you felt disoriented or disconnected uh, from your relationships and with the church? And what did it feel like when you were going through that time or that season? And stretch yourself. Stretch yourself to see if you can recall ten different emotions or dispositions that you were feeling from that time in your life. They might not... Be, well, they won't be happy memories to reflect on. Uh, but they don't just go away either. Naming them, reflecting on them, writing de- them down can help lift them to God. So stretch yourself. Write down ten of those feelings or attitudes or dispositions that you experienced during that time of disorientation. Go for more than ten if, if you want or if you can. And how did this experience of disorientation not only impact your faith and your relationship to God, but other areas in your life, your work, your play, uh, just other areas of your life? Did this period of disorientation last a day or two? A couple weeks, a couple months, a couple years. Again, don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed to admit that. It doesn't go away. You can't hide it. We can only open ourselves up to God in the midst of it. Take some time and reflect on those questions at this point.
At this time, I invite you into a time of prayer for yourself, for us as a congregation, for our nation, and for the world. If you watched the video from last week, you will notice some similarities with this prayer and the one that I led last week. Again, to draw some continuity between the lament, uh, the space of lament that we opened up and began last week and carry forward today. But you will also notice, perhaps, that it is expanded and and developed a little further. Please pray with me. God, our Savior, by the waters of the Maumee River, we sit down and weep. Sometimes we are so overcome with grief that we cannot sing. How can we sing our songs in a strange land? How can we sing our songs when there is so much pain, so much hurt, so much loss? Our hearts ache and we long to return to some semblance of normalcy. But we know that things will never be the same again. You are the God of steadfast love. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Save us, for we pour out our anger and fears and sorrows before you. Better our raging hearts broken open before you than hearts of stone hidden behind religious cliches. Hear our cry and turn our pain into joy. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. By the waters of the Maumee River, we sit down and weep. How can we sing when lives are cut unjustly short? How can we sing while cities burn? How can we sing in the midst of such polarization, blame, and victimhood? From the depths of our sin and sadness, we cry out to you. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. By the waters of the Maumee River, we sit down and weep. How can we sing when we are surrounded by disease and death? How can we sing when faced with a faceless threat? How can we sing when our bodies deteriorate and when those we love are lost to memory? From the depths of our sin and sadness, we cry out to you. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. By the waters of the Maumee River, we sit down and weep. How can we sing when we are lonely and isolated? How can we sing when our reality is shaken to the core of our being? How can we sing when what we thought was true is shattered? From the depths of our sin and sadness, we cry out to you, 
in your mercy. Lord, hear our prayer. Be not deaf to our poor pleading. Do not dash our dreams against a rock. But carry us through the journey of death, the pain of labor, and the delight of new birth. Help us to follow you in our living, our dying, and are rising again to new life. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. I'll be reading Psalms 40, 1 through 4. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Psalm 40 is an example of a psalm of reorientation. The Bible shares many stories of God delivering God's people. The Bible shares many stories of individuals who had a turning point in their life. The Bible tells stories about how disorientation and death are not the final word, but that God is a God who makes all things new, that God is a God who makes a way in the wilderness, that God is a God who is in the business of raising the dead. So has there been a time in your life 
when God, God has brought you through a season of disorientation into a season of reorientation? Has there been a time in your life when you experienced a death of something? A relationship, a dream, a preconceived notion, a self-image? When is a time that you have felt the death of something, but that God has brought you through to a rising, a new life of something else? How did God do this? How did you begin to realize that God was doing it? What was that experience like? And again, stretch yourself to write down 10 or more feelings, attitudes, dispositions that you were experiencing during that time. So often, these are the experiences that anchor our faith to help deepen our relationship with God, but if we don't reflect on them, they don't, they don't take deep root in our heart and our soul, and we might forget them. We need to call them to mind. We meet, need to bring those back to mind. In what ways was the reorientation that you experienced in what ways was that similar or different to your initial stage of orientation? Reorientation does not just mean going back to orientation. Um, reorientation means picking up the memories of orientation, picking up the pieces of disorientation, and coming to a new reality, a new creation, right? That God, is, that God has done something completely new, more than all we could think or imagine. So in what ways was it similar or different to that initial stage of reorientation? In what ways did the reorientation, did it, did it or did it not make all the problems of disorientation go away? Sometimes it addresses the disorientation directly. Sometimes it addresses the disorientation indirectly, but in a way that helps carry us beyond the disorientation. How did your faith deepen at this time? How did your understanding of God shift? And I want to say a word here that I do, I do trust and I believe that God works with us, um, even if it's in a small way, and that if you've been journeying with God for a while, most likely um, I have hope, hope and, and faith and trust that there has been a way that God has helped to carry you through a time of disorientation. I also acknowledge that if you are in the midst of that right now, a deep stage of, of, of disorientation, that it very well may feel artificial or contrived to try to jump to the reorientation. And the truth is that you can't force it. That God works not according to chronology and linear time, but that God works uh, according to Kairos time, it means the appointed time, the anointed time, when the time is right. And maybe the time isn't right, um, uh, and, and you can't force it. You can't force God's hand. So in reflecting on this idea of reorientation, if you're not there yet, or you're not in a space where you can automatically just jump to that, well, duh, of course, um, that's the reality, that's true. You can't contrive it, you can't force it. So if these questions aren't feeling where you're at at this point, so be it. But at least plant that seed in your heart. At least cling to the witness and the example of others and the church and the biblical witness 
that living, dying, rising is the cruciform pattern of Jesus. Do not forget the rising. Do not forget the possibility of new life. Hold on to that, even if it's just the small seed planted in your heart and in your soul. And now hear these words from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 11 to 19. I, I am the Lord, and there is no Savior beside me. I announced, I saved, I proclaimed, not some stranger among you. And you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. From the dawn of time, I am the one. No one can escape my power. I act, and who can undo it? The Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, says, For your sake, I have sent an army to Babylon and brought down the bars, turning the Chaldeans singing into lament. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. The Lord says, Who makes a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters? Who brings out chariot and horse, army and battalion? They will lie down together and not rise again. They will be extinguished, extinguished like a wick. So don't remember the prior things. Don't ponder ancient history. Look, I am doing a new thing. Now it sprouts up. Don't you recognize it? I am making a way in the desert, a path in the wilderness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
And at this time, I invite you to stand and receive this benediction. And now to God, who sees us in all our sin, all our despair, and all our suffering, and yet is still able to do abundantly far more than all we might ask or imagine. To God be glory in Christ Jesus and in the church from this time on, and forevermore. Go in peace.